Did you know that finding extraterrestrial life might be dependent on understanding the deep sea here on Earth? Today we are going to talk about why that is. In 1977, a team of researchers traced weird spikes in water temperature around the Galapagos Rift. Intrigued by what that could be, they sent a camera and a robotic submersible Alvin underwater to see what was going on. And that was the first time humans ever laid eyes on hydrothermal vents. This discovery revolutionized our understanding of life on Earth, and it took the discussion around the origin of life and extraterrestrial life to a whole new level. Hydrothermal vents are fissures on the seabed connected to the interior of the Earth, through which heated water is discharged, bringing with it a cocktail of diverse Earth minerals. Until the discovery of hydrothermal vents, life was thought to be dependent on sunlight, which affected how we studied the origin of life and how we looked for life outside Earth. But why did we think sunlight was important for life? All living things, from bacteria to humans, need two fundamental things to survive. Energy and let's call it food. We need them to produce, maintain, and restore the structures and systems that allow our bodies to exist and function. Food is any substance consumed by an organism for nutritional support, typically minerals and a wide variety of carbon-containing molecules. Because biological life as we know it is composed by carbon-containing molecules. Organic compounds are compounds that, in general, contain carbon covalently bond to other atoms, usually other carbons and hydrogen. And here are some of the main ones you have probably already heard of. There are those who suggest that life in other planets might not be carbon-based, but I am not going to go into that today, and I suggest you watch this video from an astrophysicist where, amongst other things, she explains why carbon is an ideal base element for life. Besides food, all living things also need energy to perform all the essential processes in our bodies. For animals, which includes us humans, the food we consume is also our energy source. So it's like a two-in-one kind of deal. That makes us something called organoetrotrophs, because we get both energy and food from organic compounds. In the past, compounds were considered organic only if they came from living things. That is not the case anymore. There are several compounds categorized as organic that do not have a living thing in their origin story. But on Earth, many, if not most, complex organic compounds do come from living things. And that's what we eat. We eat living things, like animals, plants, fungi. We don't go around eating non-organic carbon stuff, like graphite or carbon dioxide. But some do. Eventually, if you go all the way down the food web, there must be a living thing that does not require other living things to have food and energy. The so-called primary producers. They also need organic carbon-containing molecules, because we've already established that all living things need them. But here is the twist. They produce them themselves, in the case of plants and algae, from carbon dioxide and water. And they do it using energy from the sun through a process called photosynthesis. That's why they are called photoautotrophs. They didn't get the two-in-one kind of deal like we did, because their food and energy source are not the same. On the other hand, they are powered by sunlight, so I'm not sure who's the winner here. But this incredible ability makes photosynthetic organisms the base of all food webs. Ah, wrong. That's what we thought, until the discovery of hydrothermal vents. Until the discovery of hydrothermal vents, people thought that only plants and algae could be primary producers. So the logical conclusion was that rich ecosystems could only exist where there was light. So as you can imagine, people were very surprised when they saw a rich ecosystem deep in the darkness. Without light, where did the energy and organic compounds come from needed to fuel that ecosystem? Who were the primary producers in this case? When researchers sent those cameras down there, they also saw something really interesting. Giant tubeworm aggregates. This was a new, never-seen species. They collected some of them and gave them to another group of people from different institutions to be studied, including this man, Dr. Meredith L. Jones, who named the worms Riftia pachyptila. There were two very odd things about these worms. 
Firstly, they were bigger than any worm that had ever been described, which was interesting in and of itself. But the second odd thing about them, which made their size even more intriguing, was that they didn't have a mouth or a gut. 90 years earlier, Sergei Winogradsky, a pioneer in microbiology and ecology, reported for the first time bacteria that could obtain energy from inorganic compounds like hydrogen sulfide and elemental sulfur, instead of, for example, broccoli or sunlight. And they could also survive without organic compounds as food. These organisms are called chemoautotrophs. Chemo, because they obtain energy from inorganic compounds, and autotrophs, because they also obtain their food from inorganic compounds, or they make it from inorganic compounds, usually carbon dioxide. Despite this discovery in the late 19th century, these chemoautotrophs' potential as primary producers was never really deeply explored in the following decades. But fast forward to 1977, Janasz and Wiersen considered that this could be the answer to how communities in hydrothermal vents survive in the dark. But in this case, instead of getting energy from light, these bacteria would get their energy from hydrogen sulfide. The researchers who were studying the new giant tubeworm species combined that information with the fact that the tubeworms didn't have any apparent eating or digestive apparatus and decided to test whether the tubeworms were being fed by these suggested new types of bacteria. And lo and behold, in a paper published in 1981, then grad student microbiologist Colin Cavanaugh and her fellow co-authors found a new bacterial species living inside the tubeworm. The bacteria has since been named Endohyphtia Persephone. Sorry if I butcher that. Turns out these little Indochiftia bacteria provide nutrients to the worms, and that's how the worms live without a mouth. They get their energy from sulfur compounds and, just like plants, produce their food from carbon dioxide in the water. Since then, several other chemoautotroph microbes have been discovered around the world, and they serve as the basis for food webs in hydrothermal vent areas in the deep sea. This discovery revolutionized how we see life. It changed our view of what pre-existing conditions need to exist for life to to exist. We now understand that light is no longer essential for life to exist, and that life can thrive in the darkest of places. On Earth, the origin of life, or abiogenesis, is thought to have started between 3.5 and 4 billion years ago. The earliest evidence for life comes from fossilized microorganisms, such as stromatolites, dating back to approximately 3.5 billion years. These structures suggest the presence of simple single-celled organisms, capable of photosynthesis back in the day. But this doesn't mean that others didn't exist before, because most microbes, like bacteria and archaea, are mostly soft and composed of stuff that does not fossilize. And even if they did, but were buried somewhere in the bottom of the sea, it would be really difficult for us to find. There is still an ongoing discussion as to which microbes appeared first, autotrophs or heterotrophs. And this is tightly linked to where and how life originated. How did the first life forms appear? Any origin of life theory must account for how complex organic compounds ended up stably agglomerated inside membranes interacting with each other through metabolism, forming living cells. It must also account for how they developed the capacity to self-replicate. Several hypotheses on the origin of life have been put forward. Some focus on explaining where it started. For example, in the years around 500 BC, Anaxagoras proposed the cosmic panspermia hypothesis. He said that life originated from cosmic seeds that were scattered through the universe. Even though today the idea that life came from space is not universally accepted as a mainstream scientific theory, it still has its proponents and continues to be explored as a hypothesis by some. But others focus on explaining how life might have started. Like what came first, metabolism, enzymes, complex molecules, which molecules? For example, the RNA world hypothesis suggests that self-replicating RNA molecules played a crucial role in the early evolution of life as both carriers of genetic information and catalysts for chemical reactions. But until the discovery of hydrothermal vents, one of the most accepted theories for the origin of life was probably the Operain-Aldane hypothesis first suggested by Alexander Oparin in 1924 and J.B.S. Haldane in 1929. This hypothesis suggests that under the conditions of the early Earth's atmosphere, simple organic molecules could form spontaneously, driven by energy from lightning or ultraviolet radiation. 
and in 1953, Miller and Urey performed an experiment that would strengthen this hypothesis. They conducted an experiment where a mixture of gases representing the presumed early Earth's atmosphere was subjected to electrical discharges to simulate lightning. And the result? Amino acids. This was groundbreaking because they basically produced organic molecules from inorganic compounds in the lab for the first time. The hypothesis that arose from that experiment suggests that life on Earth arose gradually from inorganic molecules, with building blocks like amino acids forming first and later combining to make complex polymers. And this hypothesis was further developed. For example, the primordial soup hypothesis builds on this one suggesting that life started in the ocean, which served as a chemical environment where the necessary compounds could accumulate and interact, leading to the development of life. However, there is still a long way to go from this to this, which is something researchers have not yet been able to demonstrate through this hypothesis. In fact, none of the hypotheses I'll be talking about today have been proven, otherwise they wouldn't just be hypotheses anymore. Turns out, it's difficult to prove how something that happened millions of years ago in a different environment really happened. But by putting together different pieces, the puzzle will eventually show us a clearer image. And by testing different hypotheses, we're testing different pieces. Of course, some, however, have stronger evidence backing them up than others. Following the discovery of hydrothermal vents, German microbiologist Gunther Wechterhäuser proposed that life may have originated at deep-sea hydrothermal vents, where mineral-laden fluids provide the necessary conditions for the formation of organic molecules. He suggested that energy resulting from reactions happening at hydrothermal vents would help create organic molecules that could be precursors to life. But what does this mean? Firstly, we need to look at the different types of hydrothermal vents. The hydrothermal vents discovered in the 70s were given the name of black smokers, and since then several other similar hydrothermal vents have been discovered all around the world. They are usually located above magma chambers in the boundaries between tectonic plates at spreading zones. They are created when seawater circulating underneath the surface encounters a magma chamber, is heated and re-emerges through the seafloor at temperatures up to 400 degrees Celsius. Later, a new type of vent system called white smoker was discovered. Instead of black smoke, surprised, it expelled white smoke. And they vented slower and at slightly lower temperatures than black smokers. But a third type of vent exists. With the turn of the millennia came a new discovery, the lost city in the Atlantic Ocean. No, not Atlantis, even though that was the inspiration for the name. A completely new type of vent system, which contrary to black smokers, was tens of kilometers away from tectonic boundaries. Lost city type vents are not created by volcanic activity, but by sustained fault activity. Seawater invades the warm oceanic crust through cracks, and when it contacts with the olivine-rich seafloor, it triggers a very important reaction called serpentinization, responsible for the formation of the chimneys. These types of vents are much cooler than smoker type vents, reaching temperatures usually only between 28 and 160 degrees Celsius. The seafloor in the area is thought to be similar in composition to the oceanic crust of the the Hayden Earth, which was probably the period on Earth before life started. This, the lower water temperatures compared to black smokers and serpentinization, are the main reasons for why many look at lost city type vents as the potential starting point for microbial life on Earth. Now I want to show you part of an awesome video on research done by evolutionary biologist and microbiologist Dr. William F. Martin at the Heinrich Heine University in Dusseldorf, where he explains how serpentinization might have been involved in the origin of life. Reminder, this is only a hypothesis. During serpentinization, the circulating water reacts with reduced iron minerals in the crust. They convert water into molecular hydrogen, shown here as white balls, while the oxygen in water molecules, shown here in red, remains in the crust as iron oxides. This hydrogen is the source of energy and electrons at origins. The hydrogen can react with the surface of metals and minerals that are produced in the hydrothermal vents. Hydrogen is chemically activated by the outer electrons called d-electrons of the transition metals. On these surfaces, hydrogen meets carbon dioxide from the moon forming impact, and the reaction of life is often running. The metals also activate carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen that can react with one another on the solid phase catalytic surface. This is called heterogeneous catalysis. 
In the laboratory, such reactions generate amino acids and the most central compound in all of metabolism, pyruvate, an organic acid with three carbon atoms. Because these reactions release energy, there is nothing to stop them from going forward. Energy-releasing reactions are symbolized by flashes of light. Products can react further, and the backbone of microbial metabolism unfolds naturally along the lines of thermodynamics. Under the conditions of hydrothermal vents, 97% of all biosynthetic reactions in central microbial metabolism, starting from hydrogen and CO2, release energy. The further the compounds react, the more stable the products become. Stable products can accumulate on the surfaces of inorganic compartments, increasing their local concentrations and fostering polymerization. I recommend you watch the full video if you want to understand the entire process. And despite this still only being a hypothesis, it already gives you an idea of why hydrothermal vents are such good candidates for the origin of life of microbes and potentially life itself. And serpentinization isn't exclusive to lost city type vents. It's also found in black smokers and certain terrestrial ecosystems. However, factors like temperature, environmental conditions, dispersal, and pH also play crucial roles in understanding life's origins. And they seem to be more favorable for abiogenesis in lost city type vents. When exploring the origin of life, it's essential to account for how all these different factors interacted with each other in ancient Earth. This will lead us one step further in understanding extraterrestrial life as well. We often imagine extraterrestrial beings look like this, but they might actually look more similar to the little guys we share our planet with. Usually the first thing we look for in other planets when assessing their potential to harbor life is the presence of liquid water. But as we've just discussed, we need more than that for life to exist. So in astrobiology, which is the scientific discipline that explores life in the rest of the universe, the study of microbes that live in extreme environments like hydrothermal vents is very important, as understanding microbes might be the window to understanding how life might have started on other planets. So with that in mind, does, for example, serpentinization happen anywhere else in the universe? Serpentinization happens in the type of rocks called ultramafic rocks, which is what the Earth's mantle is primarily made of. These rocks are characterized and composed predominantly of minerals like pyroxene and olivine. And olivine seems to be prevalent in the solar system, suggesting that ultramafic rocks are widespread. And indeed, besides Earth, there are two other bodies in our solar system with evidence for serpentinization, Mars and Saturn's moon Enceladus. Let's look at Mars for a second. Mars, one of our neighboring planets, is the fourth planet further away from the Sun in our solar system. It is a cold desert world, currently lacking permanent liquid water. But it had a history resembling Earth's early stages. 4.6 to 3.7 billion years ago, Mars saw widespread deposits of hydrated minerals, suggesting the presence of liquid water. Even ancient seas with hydrothermal sediments have been found in Mars. Additionally, ultramafic and serpentinized rocks have been discovered on the planet. This hints that ancient organic synthesis might have happened through serpentinization, and who knows, maybe those organic compounds might have further organized into cells. Unfortunately, we have not yet found life on Mars. Present conditions on Mars' surface are harsh and not suitable to life, even microbial one. But it might still exist, or have existed, in the subsurface. But Martians are not the only potential aliens being investigated. In 2005, NASA's Cassini spacecraft discovered something unexpected. Icy water particles and gas gushing from Enceladus's surface. It turns out Enceladus is an ocean world. Ocean worlds are a group of planetary bodies in our outer solar system known to have a liquid water ocean. Many of these contain vast oceans beneath a thick ice crust, and some of them also have rocky seafloors, much like we have on Earth. Another example of such a planet is Jupiter's moon Europa, but Enceladus is special. The plume expelled from Enceladus' surface turns out contains, besides water, grains of silica, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and methane 
some of which are key components of hydrothermal vent systems here on Earth. They also expel organic chemicals and other important chemical compounds that microbial life here on Earth uses to grow. And the cherry on top of the cake was the finding of geological signatures that strongly suggest the occurrence of serpentinization in the planet. If the hydrothermal vents hypothesis for the origin of life turns out to be the explanation for the origin of life on Earth, celestial bodies like Enceladus are perfect starting points for the search of life beyond Earth. And we can go further than that. Beyond our solar system, over 5,500 exoplanets have been discovered. Some could have conditions suitable for liquid water. Some of these exoplanets may have formed with continents and oceans or evolved from icy bodies into global oceans with hydrothermal vents. The search for life-friendly environments on exoplanets is ongoing, with missions like the James Webb Space Telescope aiming to detect substances that might indicate life, called biosignatures. Exploring these diverse environments, from Mars to exoplanets, allows scientists to test hypotheses about the origins of life. And not only the hydrothermal vent origin of life hypothesis, but all other proposed origin of life hypotheses as well. For example, there is also recent evidence for hot springs being the place where abiogenesis happened. This is a theory I did not talk about in this video but which is also being explored by researchers and which is also being taken into consideration when looking for extraterrestrial life. For example, early Mars is thought to also have had hot springs, so something else to look into. If we figure out the necessary conditions for life to arise on Earth, we can specifically target planets with similar environmental conditions to look for life. And if we do end up finding extraterrestrial life, studying the environment where it exists could bring us one step closer in understanding how life started in our own planet. Thank you everyone very much for watching. Thank you very much to all my patrons over on Patreon for supporting what I do. If you like my videos, consider donating, check it out. This is a complex topic and I left a lot of things out. So I'm sure people have a lot of questions. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.